Greetings to you all who are joining us for this, the last policy dialogue of the year, which we are holding jointly with our partners, the Research and Advocacy Unit, RAO, with my fellow uh, comrade, Tony Rila, who is a senior researcher, and he's the one who's presenting this report, which is uh, the outcome of very intense research on organized violence and torture in dealing with protests in Zimbabwe. We thought uh, there'd been a lull in the spate of abductions, uh, which have become characteristic of the Zimbabwean political scene over the last years. But just a few days ago, or in fact yesterday, our sister organizations, Crisis Coalition in Zimbabwe, in the course of their meeting, uh, AGM in Blawayo, they were attacked by a, a group of thugs purporting to be Zanu PF supporters. The point is made, they were organized, an organized group of thugs who were attacked a meeting. Of, of civic society organization, beat up people, people were injured. Um, and it's almost like business as, as usual. We've had this over the last two years at, at Surface Trust, uh, where the policy dialogue was being disrupted very by organized gangs, where book launches were, were disrupted by organized gangs. <clears throat> so this is most apt that we have this discussion on organized violence at least to warn us that the, the landscape, the environment, as we approach 2023, is not likely to be a, a rosy journey. We have reason to be afraid uh, of what is awaits us and that we lose citizens as we have in every election. Which, which elections have become war zones. 
So tonight we have uh, Tony Rila uh, to, to, to present, but more important, we have a moderator in Justina Mkoko, who is a very prominent uh, civic activist, and regrettably also because she has been one of the victims of this organized violence, abductions. And uh, we're sorry that we have to always mention this, but I think it's a, she remains a, 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 a really a flag, both in terms of the state and regime of organized violence in Zimbabwe, especially since 2000. Uh, uh, violence against the opposition, violence against civic society but also because she represents uh, the activism without which this spate of organized violence, torture, would have perhaps been more rampant and, and even more so un, un, unheard about. So these studies such as that, uh, that Tony and his colleagues are, are presenting tonight are very important in, 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 in uh, creating landmarks uh, uh, to remind us that the journey ahead is, is still a tortuous one, uh, a difficult one. So Justina, please take over. Thank you very much, uh, Doc. Um, sad news there to hear about uh, a disruption of um, CSO's AGM. Um, and uh, like you are saying, this does not augur well for a nation that's um, coming up to elections, the uh, by-elections in less than in less than three months. And if we are having to deal with such situations, um, we continue to get worried, um, especially about the shrinking space where we are supposed to be allowed to, um, to operate um, and also be able to ensure that uh, citizens enjoy their rights. And uh, on that note, I think we have a very important report that um, is going to be presented by Tony Rilla on organized violence and torture in dealing with protests in, um, in Zimbabwe. I think our constitution allows for protests to happen, but I think from what Tony is going to talk about, um, we will also see some of the challenges that citizens um, face as a result of um, uh, getting into uh, protests. Um, Doc, you have already said that uh, Mr. Anthony Rilla is a senior researcher and formerly the director at the Research and Advocacy Unit. Um, an independent research and advocacy institution specializing in human rights, transitional justice, and governance issues in, Har in Harare, Zimbabwe. Um, Tony, over to you. We are looking forward to hear more about the, the research um, in terms of organized um, violence and torture, looking at protests. I know we have also, in this series, looked at um, organized violence uh, in torture in relation to elections. Over to you. Thank you, Justina, <clears throat> and welcome everybody. Um, this is the end of the year. It's been a long and very, very difficult year, as both Ibo and Justina have pointed out uh, in the old adage, plus sa chance, c'est la même chose. Uh, two days ago or a day ago, once again, a meeting is broken up of civil society activists or civil society people just doing what they normally do. So I'm going to present this report and the findings. Um, and if I may, I would like to share my screen, if I can. I'm sure you can. You are co-host, right. Tony. Okay, right, let me go to the top. Sorry, seems to come in <laughs> halfway through. 
Okay. Okay, let's begin with a scene that I think Zimbabweans are entirely familiar with, and that's people assembling to express their views and those views being broken up by the police. And that is the focus of this particular report. Uh, it's one of a series of reports, and it's a series of reports undertaken by Rao on behalf of a consortium of organizations who work together, the Human Rights Forum, the Counseling Services Unit, ourselves, Veritas and Pool Zimbabwe, all members of the Human Rights Forum. Uh, and uh, Justina has been the chair and the lead of that for many years. So we're dealing with organized violence and torture, dealing with protests in Zimbabwe. Uh, this is part of a series of reports that that consortium is releasing. It deals really with the history of organized violence and torture over the years. Uh, and not just with Zimbabwe, but as you can see, one of the first reports we released was, it was an organized violence and torture in Zimbabwe during the Liberation War. Um, we're a very young population, and I think many people uh, who are alive today have no memory of what happened in this period, really, from 1972 to 1980, an extremely brutal period in our history in which organized violence and torture was rampant um, and leaves its scars today. We then launched another report on organized violence and torture in elections in Zimbabwe, and then we looked at human rights and displacements. Uh, we had a very animated discussion here at SAPES on the displacements that have taken place in the past and people talking about displacements that were taking place at the moment. So I just want to um, just quietly and quickly just point out some, a, a, an important characteristic of this term organized violence and torture. Uh, it's drawn from uh, the United Nations Convention Against Torture uh, and uh, was a fundamental part of uh, a definition of organized violence and torture, as far as I know, the first definition that was made in Zimbabwe in 1990 in a very large conference in Harare. Uh, the concern then was torture, but the Southern Africans and the Africans in general broadened it to include a range of other things. And that's why we've looked at things like elections and we've looked at things like displacements. So I just want to draw your attention very quickly to a couple of elements here. Firstly, torture must be physical or mental as it's highlighted there. It is not merely uh, physical abuse, it is also psychological abuse. And so torture can be very dramatically uh, damaging to people purely by the means of mental or psychological means. And there's a variety of reasons why torture takes place. It's you know, the classic one we think about, about getting information from people or intimidating people or coercing people. But the critical thing about this definition is it happens as the highlight says here, at the instigation of or with the consent or acquiescence of a public official or other person acting in official capacity. Those of you who've read the uh, press briefings on what happened in Bulawayo yesterday will note that what was commented was that uh, a bunch of people purporting to be members of ZANU-PF went in, disrupted the entire meeting, broke things, assaulted people, and then were the police were called and the police declined to take any action, even though the instigators could be pointed out to the police. So that's this presumption that when torture and organized violence takes place, if there is no action by the state, the presumption is that it, there is the consent or the acquiescence of a public official. That's the important thing to bear in mind when we are now talking about uh, organized violence and torture. Uh, now, the first point to make is that protest, as Justina just pointed out, is a constitu constitutionally enshrined right for citizens. They have the right of freedom of assembly and association, and they have the right of freedom to demonstrate and petition. Both of these rights are rights that we have. The conditionality 
is that these rights must be exercised peacefully. And this is going to be an important text through what we look at. Now, protesting for Zimbabweans has become uh, anathema. Zimbabweans don't protest. If you look at the Afrobarometer and you look at them from 1990 to 2021, you will see that half and up to three quarters of Zimbabweans say they will never join a protest or demonstration. And the question is why? It's a big question. We've been watching demonstrations across the world against COVID. We've been watching demonstrations around COP26 where people have been marching and protesting and expressing their views to say, we do not like uh, the lockdowns or we demand the right that people take place, take, do something about climate change. In Zimbabwe, we say by nearly three quarters, we would never join a, a protest. Now, if you look at that and why, uh, what you will see in this graph, and this is a piece of research that we did a while ago, about six years ago, looking at the data of five Southern African countries. And we chose these five Southern African countries very specifically because they're countries that are governed by former liberation movements. And one of the speculations has been in the political science literature is that those countries governed by former liberation movements in which violent struggle was the reason for independence, those governments have a propensity to resort to violence. And if you look at the, at the, at the far end of the graph here, what you will see for Zimbabwe is that it is the most dominant country of those five countries in which violence against civilians takes place. Contrast that with the next one, which is other kinds of violence that do take place, which are not peaceful and definitely require the state to take some action and look at riots. And you will see South Africa and Namibia uh, and Angola have very high numbers of people of riots. Zimbabwe by contrast has very few. And I want you to bear in mind as we talk about this, this distinction between riotous behavior and peaceful demonstration, because this is the text of what we talk about. Now, the consequence of that for Zimbabweans is, as Alex, uh, as uh, Eldred Masanungore pointed out a long time ago, is Zimbabweans have become risk averse. And what we mean by risk averse is that they are unwilling to express their views in public. They are unwilling to join in protest, as the graph said before. They're unwilling to uh, go to community meetings. And if you look at this graph and you look at what's happened from 1999 to 2017, which is the last data that we have, and this is a piece of research that Rao did with Mpoy, you will see by the end of the 90s, Zimbabweans, 84% of them were not risk averse. They were risk takers. They felt that they were able to express their views. And that came from a decade of the growing civil society, the National Constitutional Assembly, the launch of the MDC, the constitutional stuff. What you can see is what followed was Zimbabweans still had faith in 2004, after two extremely difficult elections, that they were still able to express their views. By 2005, very few Zimbabweans felt that. And that was a year in which Operation Murambuchina occurred and Zimbabweans learned very bitterly how brutal the state could be. And you can see over time, as you follow this graph, that even by 2017, it's a very small percentage, it's only half the Zimbabweans feel that they are able to take risks. Now, this is a context in which it's very important to try and understand the nature of uh, peaceful protest in Zimbabwe. So the focus of this report is to look at the rights of peaceful protest and peaceful assembly. It's to look at the suppression of these rights, and it's the consequences of protesting in Zimbabwe through three case studies. <clears throat> now, in putting these history reports together, 
and particularly on peaceful protest, we have not tried to summarize in enormous detail the number of peaceful protests in which organized violence has taken place. Okay? This is a monograph on its own. From 2000 to 2021, demonstration and protest year after year, month after month, has met with organized violence and torture. So what we did was we took three case studies, and we'll talk a little bit about those case studies. It also has an additional focus on women. We've just ended the 16 days of activism against gender-based violence. Uh, and uh, although we had some logistic problems, the intention was to really launch this report during the 16 days. And for a very specific reason. And that is that when demonstrations and protests take place and women join them, you can almost definitely assume the intention of that demonstration or that protest is likely to be peaceful. I think it's very clear to all of us that women do not in general and in the vast majority participate in violent political activity. What they do, and certainly in the modern age and since uh, 2000, women join protests in the anticipation that the protest will be peaceful and to lend their peaceful voice to whatever demonstration or protest happens. So that's the point of this, this report. Now we began, begin this report, and, uh, I'm not going to spend an enormous amount of detail as we have some very uh, erudite commentators to comment on the issue. <clears throat> we took the point of departure the, as the peace march that took place on the 1st of April in 2000. It was a very important point for us, and today is echoed actually in the crisis uh, uh, fiasco that happened yesterday in Bulawayo. This was a peaceful march by the NCA, composed of the women, the churches, of labor, of all of these people, to make the case that the elections needed to be peaceful. And so a march was organized to peacefully point out that Zimbabweans, as had been the case in the referendum, needed to go forward into these elections in an atmosphere of peace. That didn't happen. What actually happened was a mob uh, emanating from ZANU-PF headquarters hit the streets and attacked the protesters with sticks and stones uh, and all manner of weapons. And, and many people were injured and many people uh, learnt right at their cost uh, the point about peaceful assembly and association and the right to protest was not going to be tolerated by the state. Um, and I'm not going to, that was report, in fact, didn't generate quantitative data. We can't tell you how many people were injured, really. We can't tell you how many people were traumatized. But what we can point out is the response of spokespeople from the state. And in the report, as you will read, these are the comments by Douglas Mejia, a well-known war veteran, and quoted in the Sunday Mail on the following day. He points out that the MDC and MDC, NCA and MDC must not demonstrate against us, and the NCA and other church members should not provoke us. But more tellingly, he says, we need to show them that we are the ones who are the legitimate rulers of this country. It's our legitimate right to rule this country forever, whatever the outcome of the elections. What the MDC is aiming at is to give this country back to the British. We will not allow this, even if it means going back to the bush to stop them. Now that's the first, that's the 2nd of April, 2000. And you can hear those comments echoed for the last 21 years. And the consequence for peaceful demonstration has been essentially that all demonstrations and protests are regarded as anti-government regime change, uh, the views of enemies. And, and that's a very important perspective. It speaks to a total lack of tolerance to regard anybody who expresses their views that might be contrary 
to the ruling party and the government to be regarded not merely as citizens expressing their views, but as, and, and not merely opponents, but as enemies. The next two case studies we chose specifically because they involved women, as I started out in the beginning. The first one is to look at the National Constitutional Assembly. And the National Constitutional Assembly uh, demonstrated all the way up until this point uh, of the 1st of April 2000, a, a clear commitment to peaceful protest and demonstration and petitioning. The consequence for the NCA rolling out uh, was extreme. And so some research was undertaken with the NCA in 2008, many years later, eight years later, looking at the women of the National Constitutional Assembly. And, and what you can see in this very little graph, and there's a lot of text that goes with this, are the kinds of experiences that these women uh, uh, had as a consequence of their being members and being willing to express their views about the constitution, about elections and many other issues. This table contrasts ordinary members against activists. These are women who said they were merely ordinary members of, of uh, the NCA. And those women who said they took an active part in the activities of the NCA. Now, I want to draw your attention to the differences for every one of these violations. And these are all what the components of what is called organized violence and torture. And actually, not only that, they are crimes in the criminal law of Zimbabwe. And look at the difference in the scores. If you look at assaults, you'll see that uh, over 20% or nearly 20% more activists experience. And as you go down the table here, what you will see is on every single violation, the activists, those people who are active, um, receive many more violations. Uh, so there's, it's very clear to, to everyone in the NCA that if you are an active member of, of the NCA, you will expect that you may be abused uh, and experience organized violence and torture. If you look at who does it, and this is very relevant for what happened yesterday, you'll see who, who participates in this? The police, the riot squad, CID, to some extent, PC. But then you see this whole group of people who are not state agents, youth militia, war veterans, political party members, and you will also see the army. And what is very important about that is that whilst these first four categories of people have to some extent, the right to deal with riotous behavior, none of these people should be indulging in riotous behavior. And in fact, these first four should be constraining these people from committing violence against ordinary citizens who are peacefully protesting. So for women, there are extreme risks in expressing your voice. Now, another group, that we are all very aware of and remember, were women of Zimbabwe Arise, Wosa, who from 2000 and onward explicitly said all the time, we have the right to protest, we have the right to peaceful demonstration and peaceful protest, and we will, uh, we will exercise that right. And the newspaper reports were filled again and again and again of demonstrations and protests by Wosa that were broken up by the police uh, and other, other groups, and then the treatment that they experienced. Assaults, death threats, uh, those that lived in communities were forced to attend public meetings, humiliating and degrading treatment. Uh, in, in cells, they were frequently treated in humiliating and degrading ways, which is one of the components of the UN Convention Against Torture. 
take a look at the last one, removing their underwear, being forced to remove your underwear in custody, insults, political threats, torture, both physical and mental. And you can see the frequencies of these are extremely high. And the numbers of women that were affected are extremely high. And who were the perpetrators? Well, it's a very wide organized number. But what you can see as you go down this thing is the number of organizations, the number of alleged perpetrators that belong to the state is extremely high. The police in the same members same, num uh, same categories as those reported by the NCA. But you also hear CIO, district administrators, members of parliament, provincial administrators, traditional leaders, all implicated and alleged to have been perpetrators against them. Now, that's extremely serious. Now, one of the things that is important to, to notice is that if you perceive to be an enemy of the state, then the heavy hand of the state begins to focus on you much, much more uh, assiduously and in a much more focused way. And this next slide demonstrates this. Uh, when we, the study was done with the women of, uh, of Warza, we, we asked them to report on the number of trauma events, okay? that they experienced in each year. So uh, these are all trauma events of one kind or another, assaults, death threats, uh, humiliating insults, political threats, etc. These are all different kinds of trauma. And what you can see from this graph is that from 2000 to 2007, there is a straight line in which the number of trauma events that the wars of women begin to experience grows and grows and grows and grows. It gets worse and worse and worse. And the implication behind that is that the state is now taking a much more forceful and aggressive uh, approach to them. So this is just a snapshot. This is a very small snapshot, snapshot of what happens to pe people who peacefully demonstrate or, and exercise their constitutional right to assemble, as was the case with crisis, and their constitutional right to assemble and petition. So therefore, it is a constitutional right um, to assemble peacefully in Africa Unity Square and to go to parliament and to present a petition on any issue that a group of citizens wishes to present. This is constitutionally protected. It is in the Bill of Rights. Uh, and so it is very important as we go into what is, and, 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 and Ibo Mandaza pointed out, what is likely to be a very difficult year and a year heading into elections in which we forcefully uh, address this problem of the rights to do that. And to that end, we make a series of recommendations in this report. Firstly, that the right to demonstrate and process must be observed. So the presumption must be that all demonstrations and protests must be allowed to take place. And it's on the onus is on the authorities to protect peaceful protest and demonstration. It is not enough for the police to say you cannot hold your demonstration because it is likely to be violent. Because the evidence is generally that the peaceful protests, the violence will be perpetrated by the state. So the onus is on the police to demonstrate in what way it will be not peaceful. And secondly, the rights to assembly and association must be honored in the observance. That means that citizens have a right to assemble and protest uh, as, uh, as these are the peaceful ways in which we can express our views. The primary role of the Zimbabwean police, it's in the constitution and it's in the police act, is to provide protection for the citizens of Zimbabwe. It's not to treat them as enemies. And that means that this includes citizens exercising their constitutional rights. And if you've been looking at the protests that took around uh, COP26, one of the things that will strike you 
is the peacefulness of those demonstrations and the ways in which the police are facilitating and assisting the demonstrators to exercise their peaceful right. It is not there to block them, they're there to protect them in a way that was absent on the 1st of April in 2000. The job of the police was to protect them, as was the job of the police to protect crisis and to arrest those who interfered with these constitutional rights. And the government must honor its commitment. And that means that the government must express its view to protect the constitution, to protect these rights, to ensure that the police protects the citizens on uh, expressing their views. Now, I think that's all I need to say at this particular point. Uh, I hope people will read the report and we sincerely hope uh, as the group concerned with yeah, assisting victims of violence, that what we will see is explicit statements from the state to the effect that they will protect our rights and they will direct the police to protect our rights. Thank you, Justina. Thank you very much, uh, Tony, for that um, presentation of the report. Um, I think what uh, stands out for me is the issue of Zimbabweans being risk averse, and I think there's an issue of fear as well that comes into this. Um, and uh, I think I'm really concerned about the absence of safe spaces for women to be able to exercise their fundamental rights. Um, and uh, I think an issue that has also come out of that presentation is also the issue of entitlement that comes out when someone says they cannot demonstrate against us. But I think when you go to the constitution, it actually does not say these people cannot um, protest against these. And we also recognize that the examples that you have given in terms of the protesters, the protesters have actually done what they have done in peace and they are actually disrupted. The disruption is coming from the outside. Um, I would like to now introduce our next speaker who is Miss um, Roselyn Hanzi, who is a lawyer registered to practice law in Zimbabwe, employed by Zimbabwe Lawyers for Human Rights in Harare since 2007, and is presently working as the director of the Zimbabwe Lawyers for Human Rights. She has managed the Human Rights Defenders Institutional Reform and Policy Formulation portfolios. Rose, you have had Tony go through that um, that report. Uh, the examples might have been from a number of years. Um, maybe you can speak to us um, about what is happening now and also how citizens can actually be encouraged to move from being averse and also being able to um, exercise their fundamental rights. Over to you, Rose. Thank you, Justina. And thank you, Tony, for that uh, presentation. Um, the research is really timely considering the fact that we are moving towards uh, another election. In a few months' time, we'll be in election mode if we have already not started at the moment. Uh, just to thank the organizers for organizing this platform. Uh, I'm going to maybe just uh, pick from um, some of the issues that Tony was raising, and I think I'm going to remove my camera. I don't have very good light uh, where I'm sitting right now. Um, maybe just to start off by saying, I think one of the main concerns um, that uh, we should be looking at as a country is the fact that um, we still have the same problems that we had before the 2013 constitution was uh, adopted, uh, was voted uh, in by an overwhelming majority of Zimbabwean citizens. And uh, with uh, that constitution, which is some of the provisions that uh, Tony has already spoken to at the moment, uh, we also have other progressive provisions in the constitution, particularly around the fact that we have uh, a whole chapter 
that talks about um, the mandate of uh, the state security agents and how they should be behaving uh, when they are carrying out their mandate in terms of the constitution. And one of the main uh, provisions that um, should be guiding us as a nation is the fact that uh, section 208 actually says that um, members of the security services must act in accordance with the constitution and the law. And um, when they are doing their work, exercising their functions, they must not violate uh, fundamental rights and freedoms of um, any person. Before 2013, we had a lot of uh, cases that were documented by uh, whether it was the Human Rights NGO Forum, the Research and Advocates Unit, or even the Zimbabwe Peace Project, where peaceful protests were disrupted by mainly the law enforcement agents. And sometimes uh, they were assisted by the military. And then after 2013, we continued to see the same pattern where particularly the law enforcement agents, they are still using the same uh, forceful means in terms of uh, stopping or disrupting protests, which are actually recognized in the constitution. And with uh, the 2013 constitution, we all expected that there will be a number of key reforms that will be undertaken to ensure that we give uh, effect to some of the provisions of the constitution. I just want to highlight um, some of the milestones in terms of um, what some of the organizations that have been working on trying to end this culture of impunity, particularly when it comes to excessive use of force by the law enforcement and also the military, especially when we are looking at uh, the way that they've been um, dealing with uh, protests. We have had a number of cases that have been filed at the courts. And uh, most of those cases have actually been ruled um, in favor of uh, the victims, especially of um, the arbitrary assaults, torture. And uh, in the most recent past, uh, we had the cases of um, the excessive use of uh, force where live ammunition was actually used on some citizens following the 2018 elections. Whilst we have recorded some of those milestones in terms of actually getting monetary awards on behalf of those victims, the main concern has been the delays in terms of uh, getting those cases finalized um, is one of the main challenges for anyone who would actually want to seek justice or would actually want to be part of uh, the people who compel reforms within particularly the law enforcement agents by taking them to the courts and forcing them to pay up, especially where they violated uh, fundamental rights and freedoms. So we have the, the main challenge of uh, delays, although of course we've recorded some victories in terms of securing monetary awards. Uh, the main challenge that we continue to see, why we continue to see these cases is mainly because the perpetrators who are responsible they've not really been paying for those monetary awards from their own pockets. Normally, those awards are paid for from the Consolidated Revenue Fund, uh, which is basically our tax money. And in a few cases where the perpetrators have been identified, then uh, there've been some claims actually that have been filed against them in their personal capacities. And some have actually been forced to pay uh, we had one case where a police officer had uh, the judgment entered against them by the magistrate's court, and uh, we succeeded in making sure that they would pay for that monetary award every month. Uh, we actually had uh, their salary garnished, which, which for us is an effective way of sending a message that if you violate human rights, then you will have to pay. Um, and if you are going to be paying from your own salary, then even if it's not going to cause reforms that are widespread within the whole service, at least for that police officer who is affected, they'll be setting an example and sending an example to the others who may want to violate that 
if you are identified and you're taken to court, then you can actually be made to pay for, for those transgressions. So, so we have had um, those successes and of course those challenges. But also just to say that um, in terms of what citizens should actually expect uh, when their rights are, are violated, particularly if they are enjoying their rights as provided in the constitution, they have an entitlement to actually seek justice. Uh, but of course they have to do it within the confines of the law. And uh, in terms of the current laws at the moment, you're supposed to be, if your rights are violated by members of the police service, then you should be filing the claim within eight months of uh, the violation uh, occurring. So there's a limitation, a temporal limitation in terms of when you can actually file a claim for damages against the police. And uh, you don't necessarily have to know the exact name or the actual identity of the police officer, as long as you can identify that uh, this was a police officer by their dressing. Uh, we all know that most of these um, police officers and uh, most of these state agents, they do not really identify themselves. They don't wear false numbers. The only way you can identify is uh, by being able to identify they were wearing a uniform that a police officer should be wearing, whether it's uh, for the um, police reaction group or the ordinary service uh, police, or even for the military, as long as you can identify them by their dressing, then you should be able to actually claim, not just against the um, responsible police officer, if you can't name them, but also against their supervisors, their superiors, including the officer in charge, the commissioner general of police, and even the minister of home affairs because they are liable in terms of the law um, in the event that their employees um, violate rights, then they should be liable to pay for any claims that may arise. Uh, we have also had um, the challenge of um, delays in payment sometimes of uh, these claims, even if the court awards the damage, um, which is of a monetary value to, to the victim, then it's not possible for lawyers to go and attach property that belongs to the state uh, in terms of the State Liabilities Act. Um, so the, the recourse has been to file further court action to compel the police uh, service to actually pay up uh, for those uh, claims of damages. And uh, maybe also just to highlight that um, the um, other challenge that we have seen, but obviously that should not stop anyone who has uh, rights violated, particularly if they are enjoying their rights as provided in the constitution, is the fact that sometimes if there are monetary changes in terms of the monetary policy, then this can actually affect um, the value of uh, the claim that you can file against um, particularly the police or even the military who assault you when you are sitting or exercising your right to peaceful protest, which you are perfectly entitled to in terms of the constitution. So we, we have had a challenge of having uh, filed some claims during the US dollar era and then the cases are finalized when it's now real-time gross settlement. And for some, the awards would have devalued, but for some we've been fortunate enough that um, when the judges uh, or the magistrates um, then look at the final award, uh, they take into consideration some of those changes and uh, make sure that um, the way that the value will be recorded will not necessarily result in such a loss. And of course, um, just to also remind um, the listeners, particularly those who would want to continue to assert um, their rights to peaceful protest, that in terms of the constitution and the law, you're perfectly entitled to assert your rights peacefully. Uh, the only limitation is that when you're exercising your rights, you have to do so with due regard to the rights of others. And uh, if you do come in conflict uh, with uh, the law, then there are organizations that do offer support to be able to seek for justice, 
or for or seeking for any other remedies that may be appropriate, which may even include sometimes um, filing uh, criminal charges against um, the police officers or the perpetrators from the state agents who may be responsible, whether it's for assaults or torture, is you are perfectly entitled to do in terms of the constitution. Um, thank you very much for the time. Thank you, Rose, for that uh, presentation. Uh, I think the last bit that you were talking about reminds me of um, when you guys as lawyers and doctors were threatened that you had put out statements to say, if anything happens to you, um, we are available to do one, two, three. Maybe you might want to comment on that. Out, so, uh, well, yes, um, it was rather unfortunate that um, that statement came out from the highest office in the land. Um, there's really nothing illegal in terms of the work that uh, human rights lawyers or doctors for human rights are maybe doing where they are just reminding those who may need their services of where they can find them. Um, and I would really want to repeat that if um, someone is their rights violated when they are setting their constitutionally protected rights, then they should be able to reach out to human rights lawyers and also doctors for human rights without any fear uh, of um, the powers that be further persecuting these service providers because there's nothing illegal in terms of uh, the lawyers or the doctors actually making people aware of the services that they provide. Thank you very much, um, Rose. I hope that that has helped our listeners appreciate that when they want to um, exercise their rights, it's within their power as long as they are doing that peacefully um, and that um, they're able to get the defense that the lawyers and doctors are able to provide them. And I think it's good news as well that there are those in security um, forces who have been forced to uh, sort of settle damages um, personally and not through uh, taxes that people are paying. Maybe we can, um, at the end of the day, be able to deal with impunity because if someone then recognizes mm -hmm. that they might be punished that way, they might actually then kind of not accept to be given such an order when they know that they are violating the rights of, um, of citizens. And now we are going to hear from uh, Alec Chadehama, who is a legal practitioner and one of the founding partners of Mizum Chadehama and Makoni Legal Practitioners. He is professionally associated with the following organizations. He is a member of the Law Society of Zimbabwe, 1991 to date, member of the Zimbabwe Lawyers for Human Rights, board member of the Belvedere Teachers Technical College, chairperson of the Voluntary Media Council of Zimbabwe, board member of the Zimbabwe Doctors for Human Rights, trustee of the Zimbabwe Labor Lawyers Trust. Um, and um, I will give the mic to you, um, Alec. Uh, let's hear your comment in terms of the report that has been um, tabled uh, by Tony Rilla. Thank you very much, Justina. Uh, thank you, Service Trust. Good evening, colleagues. Thank you very much, Tony, for the comprehensive report. It is very difficult to add anything to it because it is uh, as comprehensive as one can imagine. But Tony's report has just reminded me of Brigadier Anselm Sanyatwe's appearance at the Montlande Commission, responding to a commissioner who had asked if any dead bodies were recovered from the area where the kneeling soldier was firing. 
He said the following. No, sir. If you watch that video closely, that is soldier who took a kneeling while he's firing. If you check properly with the military experts, that rifle was being fired at an angle 45 degrees in the air and not direct to the people. When asked why the soldier was kneeling, Sanyat was said he took that position because he was avoiding missiles that were being thrown at him. So if you challenge the state and call upon them to respect the right to protest, these are the kind of comical and the hilarious responses that you are likely to get from the state and its institutions. Yet, they are quite tragic in their application. And if you want to consider anything about them, Tony's report highlights case studies in respect of the MCA and women of Zimbabwe arise, and to some extent, the MDC. While he is focused on these organizations, you can actually extrapolate his observations and findings to any other protest by civil society organizations or by any other organizations that are perceived to be under government or that the government considers as promoting regime change. I can safely say that in respect to the two organizations that like the NCA and WOSA, I can personally relate to these two organizations because as far back as 2000, I happen to be one of the lawyers for the two organizations. I remember at one point, Professor Maduk was the most arrested person in the country. And so was Jane Williams. All because they were peacefully protesting. I will not forget one May, 2003, a record 450 women arrested at Warren Park when they were holding a meeting for the NCA. It was a very cold night. They could not even fit the cells of Warren Park. And they were there in the open shivering and so on. I will not forget us going to Selu and Chegut to represent members of Waza who had been intercepted by the police on their way on foot from Mulawayo to Harare to present flowers on Valentine. That is the kind of situation that we have in the Zimbabwean context. Tony has also highlighted important facts that these rights to peacefully protest are provided for in the constitution of Zimbabwe, extensively for that matter. You can read section 58 of the constitution, provides for freedom of association, section 59, freedom to demonstrate and petition, section 61, freedom of expression and freedom of the media, section 66, freedom of movement. You can as well add section 67, political rights, which gives you rights to participate in the activities of a political party, to participate in peaceful political protests, participate in gatherings for peaceful political activities and so on. You can read section 68, the right to the administrative justice, as well as section, six, section eight, the right of women. 
But not only are these rights protected in terms of the Zimbabwean constitution, but also in terms of international norms and practices. For example, the United Nations Universal Declaration of Rights covers those rights. The African Charter on People's and Human Rights they have those rights, as well as the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. Even the International Labour Organization, they recognize freedom of association and protest as right that is at the heart of the rights of workers. And yet, even if you see the ZCDU trying to protest specifically for that matter, they are treated as much the same as WOSA, as NCA, and as the MDC, and any other political party. But if you also look at the jurisprudence of the Zimbabwean courts, they've long since recognized that these rights are at the heart of the democratic agenda of Zimbabwe. If you consider such cases as uh, the case of Inre Munumeso, the case of Tenebit and another versus Minister of Home Affairs, the case of Dari and others versus Minister of Home Affairs, the Supreme Court of Zimbabwe, which is the highest court of the land, was very clear that peaceful protests are at the heart of the democratic agenda in Zimbabwe. So, not with this tending the clear provisions of our constitution and the protection that this right is given under international law, we still have a lot of challenges when it comes to enforcement and promotion of human rights in Zimbabwe. And Tony has also done well to identify the perpetrators. They are clearly state institutions or those that have the support of state institutions, the police, the army, the CIO, the NOP of political activists, militia, war veterans, and so on. Ironically, it is the state and related state institutions that have the fundamental duty to protect, respect, and promote the rights that Tony was talking about. Yet they are at the forefront of these violations. So we actually have a lot of challenges uh, on our hands. And lastly, the issues that also emerge from Tony's report. You find that in Zimbabwe, because of the involvement of the state, there are a lot of issues around impunity. You find a lot of impunity in the Zimbabwean context. That perpetrators actually get promoted. Tanya Dwe got promoted to become, uh, I think, the ambassador to Tanzania. And if you check the history of all the other perpetrators, they were promoted one way or the other. Issues of selective application of the law. If you protest, you get arrested. And the person who has assaulted you as you protest get scot free. And the culture of violence that Tony was talking about, violence perpetrated by the state, it is a worrying trend in Zimbabwe that we have this uh, worrying trend of a culture of violence. And of course, the overarching issue of fear, fear by the citizens to demonstrate because of the pushback that we get from the state and the state institutions. People are now almost afraid to take part in any form of demonstration. Attached and related to that as well, issues of civil demobilization. In fact, that as a result of this violence, many people have now become uh, demobilized. Civil society, labor, political parties, ordinary members of the public are now all risk averse, as Tony puts it, because of the experiences that they've gone through over the years. 
at the hands of the state as they try to demonstrate and assert their rights is guaranteed in terms of the constitution. You also have the issues of unfair elections. And if you look at the report, and if you also check the history, these violations normally escalate during the period of elections. And now we are already in election mode. As Justina pointed out there, they are supposed to be by elections in two or three months. Soon after that, we have uh, the harmonized the elections in 2023. After 2023, there will be challenges in respect to the outcomes of the general elections. And we are always in election mode. And because we are in election mode all the time, the violations also are present and ever looming in the horizon. Of course, attended to that is the ever decreasing democratic space. Again, being made to shrink by the state. This is why the state is uh, promulgating these laws like the PVO Act, the Cyber Security Act and so on. So attended to these violations, are other things that the state is doing, which also have the effect of making it almost impractical for people to enjoy their rights, including the right to protest. So in regard to the way forward, I entirely agree with Tony in respect to his uh, observations that uh, the state is a duty to, to observe these human rights. But also civil society, members of the public and labor, political parties and so on, they are also duty bound to assert themselves and make sure that they enjoy these rights because they are constitutionally guaranteed. So otherwise, uh, there are lots that can be said, but uh, in brief, those are my comments. Uh, thank you, Justina. Thank you very much, uh, Alec, for those um pointers there and I think what stood out for me was um, your description of what Sanya Twe said and the fact that um, I think you would look at it as being hilarious but at the same time you are saddened that it actually resulted in the tragic loss of life. So um, and I'm also recognizing as we are talking about the right to uh, demonstrate at, and petition. This seems to be a right that is selectively limited because I think in the process and in, in the years that we are talking about, we have seen people in ZANU-PF and uh, their attendant groups being able to demonstrate and uh, actually not being subjected to what the other citizens who are seen as being um, with dissenting views. Um, in that situation, how can we probably attend to it, um, Alec? So, Justina, the other constitutional provisions that also exist relate to the right not to be discriminated against. And also to the protection of the law and the rule of law. So one way is to go by Rose's suggestion that you can also assert your rights in court by suing the police, by suing whoever violates your rights, and by going to court to have your rights is violated, declared by either the Master's Court, the High Court, or the Constitutional Court. So you can take that kind of activism to, to also engage in what we now refer as lawfare. So because I'm a, a lawyer, I would also try to assert those rights from a legal point of view. But again, like I said, to attempt to assert those rights in terms of the constitution. You recall Justina when NCA used to demonstrate in the Waza, 
When the police came, they would just sit down to demonstrate beyond the doubt that they were not being violated. So that these allegations that we then find from the likes of Sanyat and from the other lies that come from the other side cannot be alleged against the protesters. So, no, so thanks also to social media, Justina, as well as uh, the, 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 the new, new, new journalists that you find everywhere. So people can also use uh, social media to propagate correct information. They can use their groups in the WhatsApp to propagate correct information and so on. So they should not wait from, for official communication. You can devise these uh, uh, creative ways of countering uh, propaganda, especially uh, through social media, through new, new, new good news and so on. So I think we just also need to be innovative. As well, just enough for me to say, to engage in collaborative efforts. I like what uh, the NGO Forum, Council of Service Unit, Rao, Surface Trust to do. But I think if we also do this on a wider scale is civil society organizations, I think the more the media and uh, our voice will be heard loud and clearer, maybe. So I think we need to be innovative as well when it comes to these approaches. Thank you very much, Alec, and thank you, Rose, as well as Tony, for those uh, presentations. Uh, and now it's uh, time for those who might have questions for the panelists. Uh, the floor is open. Uh, I think you can put your questions in the chat box, or you can simply put up your hand, uh, and uh, we will identify, and you can um, put your question to whoever it is directed to. And as I wait for the questions to come in, I think uh, one other concern that comes to mind is the limitation of um, the right to freedom of assembly and association. I think in the recent few weeks, we have seen how um, the leader of the MDC Alliance was kind of blocked to access. Uh, communities that he wanted to access. And with elections coming up, that could actually be um, a system that could be used to um, limit people being able to um, assemble uh, as they wish and also to associate with who they wish, all of which are fundamental rights that are guaranteed by the constitution. I see Tony's end. Tony, over to you. Thank you, Justina. And thank you very much to Rose and Alex for unpacking these things. I wanted to say something about the, the notion of risk aversion and, and to link it to some other issues. Uh, the forum, uh, I think it was late last year, produced a report which really strongly endorses one of the issues that, that Rose raised. And that was the, uh, the practical impunity that happens. And that is that perpetrators do not actually uh, uh, get charged, investigated, come to court. And that impunity then has left uh, civil society and particularly the lawyers in civil society with the unenviable task of going the very long, complex, actually very expensive route of civil litigation. Um, and uh, that's documented quite well in a report of the forum uh, about what has happened with, in fact, there are two reports on what has happened with these civil cases. I mean, the latest one, I just checked very quickly, uh, covered 750 odd cases uh, of people who had been forced to go the route of civil litigation in order to demonstrate that, in fact, they'd been violent. And maybe Rose can comment on that. How many of those people are likely to have been victims at public protest? I know a lot of them will be victims of elections, but some of them will be from pro uh, uh, protest or demonstrations. And the damages were extreme. They were very, very high. 
in the damages we put down in US dollars uh, against the state, there were about $3 million. Uh, and these were the closed cases. These were cases uh, that, uh, not closed cases, these were cases in which uh, damages were asserted. The previous report, I think, uh, pointed out that something like only 10% of those cases uh, were the damages ever paid. And the other point that, that Rose raised, and I think it's very important, we need to pay attention to that, is very difficult to identify the individual perpetrators. So the effect of this practical impunity is ultimately what happens is the taxpayer pays. Uh, and so in a very perverse way, the victim through contributing to tax in a way pays for his own damages. I mean, I think this is absolutely scandalous. But the broader point I wanted to make was in this uh, creation of risk aversion, we, we, it's, it's a bit like that story about the slow boiling of the frog, that you don't notice that you've been boiled until the very, very end. And in this uh, very, very hostile environment, it's not merely the attacks on uh, peaceful protesters, it's also uh, added to and embellished by the continuous use of hate speech. And, and I think the statements that I put in the beginning by uh, Douglas Mahir just resonate through the last 21 years. Those same kind of statements are made in which ordinary citizens doing what they think is the constitutional right, as both Alex and Rose pointed out, are identified as enemies and uh, people to be treated with disrespect. And this is a very, very deep problem. It speaks not merely to the legal, it speaks to a culture that has grown up in our country for two decades, nearly three decades now, in which it is conventional to treat somebody with a different opinion as an enemy. And that climate of hate speech builds on the fears of citizens, because if state agents and state officials and high people in high office continually use that kind of rhetoric against the evidence that if you do wish to express your view in public, then you are likely to meet with violence and ill treatment. Uh, so in the remedy, one of the things that is really critical is we must challenge this uh, culture of um, mutual hostility. And, I, and, I, and I'm not putting the blame uh, entirely on, 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 on the government and members of Zona Pier. Um, I think that kind of uh, rhetoric and discussion and, and use of language has become common. And that's the language of war and of violence. And I, I just saw a comment the other day in the newspaper where Honorable Sakala described Zana PF members as Zana PF pigs. This is not the language of tolerance. This is the language of fighting. And so if we do not address the culture within us in the way we treat each other and how we listen to each other's arguments, then I think it gets even more difficult to address the problems of being able to speak out in public. And so those would be my, my, my two additions. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Tony. And uh, Rose, would you have anything to add to what uh, Tony was talking about in terms of the cases? Um, I think you wanted to know in terms of the percentage of those coming out of protests, it could be yourself or Alec responding to that one. I'm still watching out for any more hands. Um, thank you. Uh, maybe just to say that um, I think one of the main um, challenges that we have seen, particularly over the last uh, 12 months, um, 12 to 18 months, has been that we do have a number of cases, particularly from uh, January 2019, and then we also had um, a few cases from 2018 uh, where we were claiming damages on behalf of those who were victims of um, excessive use of force uh, by the police, whether they were tortured, 
um, assaulted or arbitrarily arrested, then prosecuted. The real challenge that we have uh, seen has been that um, a number of the cases have not been finalized um, because the lawyers representing the perpetrators have been trying to delay the proceedings further. Uh, they've been raising all sorts of um, arguments, trying to get the cases um, or claims dismissed. Uh, one of the classic arguments that they've actually been uh, raising in the courts has been the fact that uh, they say that the victims have not been able to identify uh, whether it's uh, the soldiers especially, um, but they've just said that they were military people because of the way that they were dressed. And of course, those arguments have been dismissed. So in terms of actually being able to measure a number of the cases that have been finalized for us, some of them have been outside protests, but the majority of those that occurred during protests, they're still ongoing because of the delaying tactics that we have seen with the police, and especially the lawyers representing the military. But uh, we anticipate that most of them will be finalized um, as soon as possible. Um, a larger number of the cases that we have been pushing to finalize uh, with those uh, involving the families from Manzo. I think if you were following, uh, there were quite a number of cases that we filed on behalf of those victims whose properties were destroyed by the police. So we are still trying to make sure that all the cases are from the protests are finalized in good time, despite the delaying tactics that we've been facing, especially from the lawyers representing the army at the courts. So at the moment, I will not be able to give you like an exact figure is um, some of the cases were delayed because of the practice directions, which suspended uh, some of the um, court proceedings for cases that were not deemed to be you know, very urgent. If they were not bail cases, then there were further delays because of uh, the COVID um, the regulations and failure by our own justice delivery system to actually adapt uh, to introduce some um, facial court sittings uh, is we actually now have a law that actually says that uh, we should be able to have visual court sittings as long as um, the relevant rules are introduced to manage those proceedings. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Rose. Alec, before you come on, I also wanted to add and ask, when the Mohlante Commission did the inquiry, they also had recommendations. And some of the recommendations spoke to the training of those in the security sector so that they would be more adept in terms of crowd control. Um, is there evidence that this has happened or we are still stuck with a group that is not aware in terms of how they should be able to deal with, um, with crowds in case of protests. You need to unmute, Alec. Okay, thank you, Justina. Uh, firstly, my take has always been that there was no need for a Montlante Commission in Zimbabwe because we have our own Zimbabwe Human Rights Commission, which is well constitutionally mandated to deal with such issues. And when it came to the need to train those people, they kind of incipient protest that was just about okay before the army came in was so insignificant and so harmless that you did not need members of the army to come and assist the police in that situation. The Zimbabwe Republic police on their own, even without their unriot squad, could simply have dealt with what the decision that arose. So, I want to believe that those circumstances are not the kind of thing for which the Montreal Commission would have concluded that our police needed 
training in um, crowd control because nothing had really happened to warrant the situation that then unfolded. But I am not aware of any training that then ensued. What I think is that the police are capable of handling any protest that occurs in Zimbabwe. Because if you look at Tony's graphs, our protests are not that riotous. We don't have many riotous situations. If you look at the 1998 food riots, the police were able to contain that, although with the help of the army, the January 19 protests, the police were able to contain that. So the police are well trained to deal with that. What the police may need to be trained on, in my view, are uh, the need to appreciate human rights as enshrined in our constitution and how to police human rights. But the problem is not with the training of the police or the army. The problem is with the culture of violence, the culture of impunity, the things that the state does to us, the violations of the state of human rights and the denial of people's right to protest. That is where the problem is. I do not think therefore that the problem is in relation to the training of the police or the army. The problem is much bigger than that. You can go so far as to say that more political than the, the need to train this in the army. So that is what I, I, I would say in regard to that just now. Thank you very much, Alec. And earlier on, I think Alec spoke about how CSO citizens and uh, uh, labor and opposition parties need to also take on the role of ensuring that um, uh, they exercise uh, their rights, uh, like the right to protest. But how do these groups then how will they be able to balance this with the, um, I think you also spoke about CSOs being demobilized. And you also spoke about the issue of the private voluntary organizations amendment bill. How will that balance come out? Because we are also recognizing that there is a delib there is deliberate effort in terms of the amendment bill uh, to actually get uh, CSOs out of the way, not just CSOs, but I think a lot of other uh, groupings as well that are um, working to um, work with citizens in terms of them being able to um, claim or exercise their rights. So as you guys respond to that, you also give your, your, final, um, uh, your final remarks. Uh, before we conclude, because I'm recognizing that my audience is really averse to asking questions. I am not sure why. So I will begin with Rose, go to Alec, and we will end with Tony in terms of your, um, your final remarks. Thank you. Well, I think um, the issue that you raise around um, the disabling of civil society and how the other panelists suggested that um, there is to be more action taken. I think it would be prudent for Mr. Mshade Ama to share with us the strategies that he thinks we can employ a civil society to manage that. Um, since we are the ones who are predominantly affected and I think uh, the challenges that um, civil society are facing in terms of the PVO amendment are not entirely new. Uh, we are also seeing the same challenges um, starting to likely affect uh, the law society. I think we have seen the challenges um, that have recently emerged uh, in terms of certain litigation that has been filed against the society. 
and also the proposals to amend the legal practitioners act but anyway going back to the main subject of uh, concern that we have today um for, for us i think uh, going ahead um, a civil society i think our role will be to continue to of course encourage uh, the citizens the people in zimbabwe to assert their rights as provided in the constitution they are entitled to actually assert those rights uh, in the constitution as long as they do so uh, within the confines of the law they should be able to assert those rights and some of the issues that we have already discussed and identified as challenges, I think we have also tried to also look at the possible solutions to some of those challenges, where of course um, we increasingly do know that the selective application of the law. And when it comes to some of the rights in the constitution, there are some groups that are deemed to have uh, more rights than other groups. Um, but of course, we can always rely on the constitution to then make sure that um, the provisions of the law are actually applied equally and there is protection of the law for all citizens. So going ahead, where we see selective application of the law, I think we should be able to, as citizens, a civil society, to actually challenge that selective application of the law and not just wait for our rights to be violated before we actually approach the courts. We can also approach the courts in anticipation that our rights are likely to be violated and um, preempt some of these violations. So it is um, something that we should be looking at and we do have a lot of work ahead of us other than the work of defending our operating space, a civil society, which is obviously also going to be affecting the ordinary men, women, child in the street, who is benefiting from the services of uh, civil society organizations at all the different levels of Zimbabwean society, whether it's at the community level, at the national level, or at other levels where civil society is operating. But I'm also very keen to hear from Mr. Mshadi Ama about how to deal with this animal called the PVU amendment. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rose. Over to you, Alec. Uh, thank you, Justina. So for me, there is no one single or one size fit all strategy which we can do to assert these rights. So I think the onus is on civil society organizations to come up with programs of action to make sure that these rights are violated. And one such initiative is what we are doing. SAPES Trust, uh, RAU, CSU and others to highlight these issues and bring them to the fore. For me, this is a very good initiative. And uh, thanks to SAPES, it is an ongoing process and they've been doing it uh, very well over time. So it, for me, this is one, such a good initiative. I recall in the past, the churches tried to take everyone on board um, to say, let us come together and develop strategies the way we can ask the state what it is that, that is good for us in 2003 and so on. There was that initiative. And uh, Tony was talking of the example of Desmond Tutu, that when he was among the protesters, the apartheid regime tended to shy away from really doing what they could were he absent. So who knows if the church comes on board and leaders are together with civil society organizations, uh, we could uh, be headed for some way. But I'm also thinking, Justina, that in regard to simple organizational issues, we do not appear, or we may have challenges in terms of organizing ourselves to engage in these peaceful protests. 
I know very few organizations who are community based, who go down to the community level there to empower them so that they know that they are these rights which they can assert to better themselves. We, of course, are in town and so on and so on. But I think there is need for community organizations and for organizations, particularly CSOs, to also go right down to the roots and uh, empower communities so that they assert their rights and so on. In regard to the PVO Act, the Cyber Security Act, the attempts at amending the Law Society Act and the patriotic views and so on. You can see that there's a method in the madness that is coming from the state. They want to totally control everyone. So what they are also doing is that they are setting the agenda and they are busy following. Are we also not able to set our own agenda and pursue that in terms of our programs? Maybe so that we are simply not reacting like uh, we normally do. Because for me, Justina, there are a lot of opportunities that come our way, which opportunities we do not seize as a country. There are a lot of opportunities that come labor's way, and we see labor quiet. There are a lot of opportunities that come political parties' way, and we see the opposition political parties keeping quiet. There are a lot of opportunities that come civil society's way, and we see them either just watching or uh, making statements and keeping quiet soon thereafter. So like Rose would suggest, in regard to laws, we obviously could mount court challenges, constitutional challenges and so on. But there's a limit to which you can go to court and really get what you want. So lawfare has to be supported by other civic protests peaceful like Rosie was suggesting. And uh, lastly, you will find that uh, there's also COVID-19 is being abused to also stifle these rights, including elections. Zek announces that elections are going to be held on 5 December 2020. The vice president, stands up there and says, no, there are not going to be elections because it's COVID-19. If the world, worldwide, elections are being held, the constitution is clear that any election has to be held within 90 days. It never says that uh, if there's COVID, you then do without elections. But there are safeguards in regard to the holding elections during COVID. So these are the opportunities that Zano PF seizes. This is COVID-19, this is uh, the uh, passiveness of civil society organization and set agenda, which we then <laughs> just in a way, <laughs> and this is agenda to, to control us. So uh, in short, uh, there is no limit to what we can do. But otherwise, let me thank uh, you, Justina, Service Trust, and Tony for giving me this opportunity. And of course, our colleagues who have joined this uh, virtual discussion. Thank you, Justina. Thank you very much, Alec. Over to you, Tony, for your uh, closing remarks. Thank you, Justina. Thank you, Alec. Thank you, Rose. A um, couple of end comments. For societies to be happy and successful, there's a two-way process that the citizens must have political trust in the government and the state. The corollary of that is the state must trust its citizens. And it seems to me this is exactly what we're all talking about. Uh, the growth of legislation to hamper the activities of citizens through their groups and through citizens at large. That's the PDO bill, the Patriot bill, the attacks on the law society, et cetera, et cetera. These are all indications of a government that does not trust its citizens. So who do citizens actually trust? Well, the Afrobarometer tells us quite clearly 
the most trusted group, uh, the most trusted agencies in the country are non-governmental agencies. 75% of citizens say they trust NGOs and slightly less religious leaders. These are the most trusted people. So when we talk about Alec raising the issue about protest and uh, Desmond Tutu leading and the clerics leading them in South Africa, you know, March with the Arch was a way in which people were able to uh, circumvent the violence that might happen against them. So one of the things that's very important is that churches do need to come to the support of uh, uh, civic organizations and other groups. It, it was a way in which much of that violence that happened between 90 and 94 in South Africa was obviated. And that was by the churches taking a very decided step in, in favor of peace. Um, and I think that's one very important strategy here. And the church is taking a very strong uh, position and, and, they, and they have, in fairness, the Zimbabwe heads of Christian denominations pointed out the fears they had of elections and their reservations about whether the government was doing a good job and got roundly criticized um, and attacked in very scurrilous ways. Uh, expressing views, I think, on behalf of the members of their churches who were talking to them all the time about how unhappy they were with their lives. So certainly some kind of uh, fusion between churches and civics to be able to help us express our views. The second point I want to make is it, it's not written in the Constitution in a particular way, but it's right there, right at the beginning. And that is the responsibility of every citizen to ensure that the constitution is enforced. So the Bill of Rights really should also have a, a statement alongside every, every, every one of the rights to say it is also our responsibility. It is a citizen's responsibility to ensure that the constitution is obeyed. The rights are not gifts. They require us to protect those rights. It's not merely that the government must give them to us. We have to assert the fact that they are our rights and it is the government's responsibility and our responsibility to ensure that. That being said, we must be clear that when the state fears its citizens, as this state quite clearly does, its government does, that we face a very, very difficult task because what is ahead of us is the challenge for political power. And we are in an extremely dangerous situation. We're in a dangerous situation because the state, as my good colleague has pointed out for many, many years here, has been militarized in a very serious way. So we have to face the fact that we are in a very dangerous position, a position in which the state is insisting, not on reforms, but on, uh, uh, avoiding all reforms that are possible with constitutional amendment number two, 20, whatever number of constitutional amendments they wish to take place. So we have to find a way to collectively express our voice, as Alex has said, and to find a way of collecting, collectively linking our voices. One of the things that has ha happened, in my view, over, over the, the years since 2000 is the siloing and the atomizing of civil society. Uh, this is not uh, uh, unexpected. That's been a strategy of the state is to break us up into the silos. So the human rights workers work in a different uh, group from women's organizations and from labor and from the humanitarian organizations. And one clear intention behind the PBO bill is to attenuate and exacerbate those splits between those groups. Uh, and as Rose pointed out a while ago, there's nothing new in the PBO Act. Uh, this has all been a strategy adopted and usually adopted ahead of an election. And that's to fragment uh, human rights groups and activist groups from humanitarian groups. But until we join hands across all these different constituencies, I fear we will have very little chance of curtailing the assault on our civil liberties. So the task is not merely for organizations to join arms, 
it's for the citizens to join the organizations and encourage them to join the arts and to do at least one thing that citizens can do if they're not able to join a protest and put their feet on the street and march with the arch they can use their voice and one of the things that alex said is there is social media and there are plenty of platforms in which citizens are expressing their voice and we must harness the power of the diaspora to join us in this this struggle to assert our rights so thank you uh, the report will be made available as widely as we possibly can and as soon as we can and uh, we hope that uh, people will join this consortium of the forum and rao csu veritas and uh, the uh, Heels and Barbary Trust in the launch of further reports during next year. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tony, and uh, congratulations on the launch of the report. Um, I think we have come to the end of this session, and I will hand over to Dr. Mandaza. Thanks, uh, Justina. A very interesting discussion indeed. And it was nice to see Alec so animated uh, outside court <laughs> for a change. Uh, thanks very much. And uh, I have not much to say. I think the summaries have been provided adequately. Uh, so for me, just to thank Justina and, and the panel for the very interesting discussion that we've had today. Um, and then to say uh, to everyone, um, have a very good holiday um, and that we meet in the new year probably the last week of, of January 2022 and to thank all of those who have joined us in the course of the year 2021 and, and uh, remind you that we are these are recorded uh, sessions that will be transcribed and published so that we do keep a record of our discussions necessarily and also disseminate them as we should. In addition, of course, it's also on Facebook and on YouTube. So until we meet in the new year, goodbye. Thank you. Good night. Adios. <laughs> Thanks, Justina. <laughs>